All right, today in this video, I want to uh, describe to you adversarial inputs or adversarial attacks on neural networks. So this is the phenomenon that has come up recently and really is one of the main stumbling blocks, stopping neural networks from being used for all sorts of things like, um, you know, uh, self-driving cars and landing airplanes and uh, making legal decisions. And um, so it's one of the big problems that still remains to be solved. So the goal is to see how easy it is to fool a classifier network into misclassifying an input. So suppose we're given a data set D, which is composed of a bunch of uh, <clears throat> input target pairs, X taken from some set capital X and targets T, where T is basically some index. So X is taken from some script X space and T is a, uh, uh, well, the class of X is T. Class of X is T. So that's an index. So it's one, two, three, four, five, up to 10 or whatever. Suppose you were given a classifier network for that data set. So F maps the input space X to some other space P, K, where PK is basically a space of probability vectors. So PK is defined as the space of vectors Y, um, RK, so K vectors, such that the individual elements of that of those vectors are between zero and one, like a probability, and they add up, uh, I'll just say I, they add up to one. So these are probability vectors. So for example, y equals soft max of, um, of input, whatever. <clears throat> Okay, so we can measure its classification errors, the classification errors of this model using a loss function, R of F. So R is going to be the loss, and we're basically going to count the number of misclassifications that this network, that this model um, encounters. So it's the expected value over the data set of. Now inside I'm going to use this function, this indicator function one. And basically it's going to count the number of times the event happens. So what we're looking for is the misclassification. So we're looking for argmax over index i of yi not equal to t. So cases where the, the maximum of the output is not equal to the right index, such that um, x and t are from the data set and y is from our model. Okay, so this thing here just simply counts the number of events or occurrences. Okay, so that's going to basically measure the loss or how um, how far from perfect our model is. So let's define an epsilon ball or a neighborhood around an input X. So you might have heard of epsilon balls before. Um, so I'm going to define it like this. The epsilon ball around X of radius epsilon is equal to the set of all elements X primed in our X space such that The difference, uh, the distance to x is less than or equal to epsilon. So in other words, we've got some element here x, and we're looking for all the elements within epsilon of that. That's supposed to be an epsilon. Oops. There we go. So an epsilon ball or a neighborhood. So 
the reason I we talking about this epsilon ball in the neighborhood of x is because can we take that x that's in the middle that which is part of our training set which presumably our model classifies correctly so it our model doesn't classify everything correctly but it classifies most things correctly um, but we ask ourselves in the vicinity or in the neighborhood or in the the epsilon ball neighborhood of one of the correctly classified elements can we find a misclassified element another x primed that gets classified incorrectly we ask ourselves given an x t in d is there x primed in the epsilon ball around x such that arg max over i of y i is not equal to t, where y equals f of x primed. <clears throat> so in other words, is there a very nearby input that would fool the network uh, to yield an incorrect classification? So for in a drawing, here we have x, and we've got this epsilon neighborhood around x, and Maybe here's our, our decision boundary. So x is on the right side of the decision boundary. So f of, uh, sure I'll do like that, f of x is of class um, t. But over here, we have an x primed, an f of x primed um, is not of class T. That's just the way I'm going to write it like that. Okay. So, um, I guess, uh, I, well, X is of class T. I kind of, the, I'm, I'm abusing notation a little bit. X is of class T. X primed is not of class T. I put, I put F around it. Maybe I should fix that. Okay. So, amazingly, this happens remarkably often. Um, so these adversarial examples can be found quite easily, and this is called an adversarial attack. So and now we ask us, ourselves a question, how do we generate these examples? How do we find those adversarial examples? How do we generate examples to fool our neural network model? So there are two basic classes of methods to do this. There's the white box, white box attack, where the attacker has access to the parameters of the neural network. They know what all the weights and biases are. They know how many layers there are. They basically can see inside the model, white box. Then there's a black box attack, where the attacker doesn't know what's inside the model. It's a black box. All they know is what the inputs are, and they can see the outputs. <clears throat> so I'm going to describe a common white box attack method. Okay, so um, for black box attack methods, you can do something similar, but um, uh, what you're going to see is with the white box attacks is we're going to use the gradients inside the model. With the black box attacks, one of the uh, things you can do is uh, estimate the gradient by giving a bunch of inputs and measuring the outputs and using that estimate the, the gradients and... Uh, Oops, this should be a K attack, black box attack. Okay, so let's talk about white box attacks. Recall that learning is done by gradient descent. So if we have uh, our parameters le uh, theta in our mo model, then we update our theta as theta minus some learning rate or some uh, gradient uh, multiplier, gradient step multiplier times the gradient of our cost. 
or loss. E is our loss function. Okay, so that's gradient descent. So we um, during back prop, we propagate the gradient of the loss of the cost function down through the layers of the network. So we start at the top and we work our way down, down, down until we get, for example, down here, we'll have the gradient of E with respect to Z1. That's the input current to the first hidden layer. So we get the gradient of E with respect to Z1. What about the gradient of E with respect to X? So X is the input here. So we haven't talked about this before, but it's kind of an interesting idea. Can we push the gradient all the way down to the input and then ask ourselves the question, how would we change the input? Normally when you're training something, you don't, you don't choose the input. You just accept what's given to you and then you train on that. But we can ask, well, how would we change our input if we wanted to increase the loss or decrease the loss? And this is the gradient that will tell us that. So in order to calculate the gradient of E with respect to X, we can use the gradient of E with respect to Z1. Now remember, Z, oh yeah, yeah. Z1 is X times W0 plus some bias, which I'll just call B1. So therefore, the gradient of E with respect to X is equal to the gradient of E with respect to Z1 times the derivative of Z1 with respect to X. And I happen to know this is the answer we're going for, and I can justify it again with like a dimensional analysis. So this thing at the on the left here, this the gradient of E with respect to X should be the same size as X. So we're looking for a one by X row vector, again, using rows. <clears throat> and now this thing here is should be the same size as Z1. So it'll be a one by I'll call it H1, the number of elements in the first hidden layer. And this W transpose is H1 by X. And so you can look at that more carefully. Okay, so we can actually get our gradients using the same sort of back prop sort of stuff that we've been doing all along through this whole course. And in fact, you can just use PyTorch Autograd and get the gradient of your loss with respect to the input. Okay. This gives us the gradient of the loss with respect to the input. So this tells us how to adjust our image or our input. Um, I had image in my notes, but input is actually better. It tells us how to adjust our input in order to decrease or increase our loss. So for example, um, if we wanted to increase our loss, right, push it away from, like, normally we want to decrease our loss. If we want to increase our loss, we could say, uh, okay, change X by adding some step. Now this uh, step size, this kappa, it can be different from the learning uh, learning rate of the, the method. It's, it's just some learning rate, it doesn't have to be the same. Times the gradient um, of our loss, evaluated at some input, and I'll write it like this to specify that T is the target corresponding to X. So this is gradient ascent, pushing the image, sorry, pushing the input in the direction to increase loss. Or what if we want to decrease the loss, but for the wrong target? 
So we could also say, let's update our image by taking a step opposite the gradient, but for the wrong target. So here's our output of our model, but we're going to try to decrease it towards some other class. So this is for L not equal to the class, the, the proper class corresponding to X. This is gradient descent for the incorrect target. So <clears throat> these, these two different types of um, adversarial attacks are called untargeted and targeted. So I'll, I'll write that here. I'll say this is, um, this first one is untargeted. Untargeted. And the second one is targeted. Untargeted for the first one because all we're interested in is pushing it away from something. We don't care where it goes. We have no target. We just say, just go away from this one. For targeted, we say, we want it, We want our input to look more like this thing. Here's our target. And so we're gonna push our uh, inputs to get us in that direction. That's targeted. Okay, a quick joke. So this is one I made up just recently. Don't you hate it when someone copies your action right before you do it? It happens to me all the time. Okay, so let's see some examples of adversarial inputs. So for example, you can change a pixel intensity, um, or let me read it. For example, a change in pixel intensity of one in an 8-bit image is imperceptible to the human eye. So 8-bit images have 256 different uh, levels of uh, brightness. If we want to perturb our image by one for each pixel, it won't be perceptible. Uh, but um, the perturbation could be written delta x equals the sine of the gradient of E with respect to x. So for every pixel, we say, um, <clears throat> is our gradient positive or negative for that particular element of the input? And then just, just say plus one or minus one for each pixel. Um, so then a delta x would basically be plus or minus one for each pixel. And so if we were to look at the infinity norm of that, it would just be one. The, the, the infinity norm is basically the maximum absolute value of the elements in your vector. I know X in this, it looks like a 2D array, so it kind of looks like a matrix, but we're just treating it like a vector, so a vector infinity norm. So here's an example. There's a panda, and the model, whatever model it is, says uh, it's a panda with 57.7% confidence. So the correct, um, you know, where it's some categorical um, classifier, so the output element that corresponds to the panda would be 0.577 after going through some soft max, right? Now we add this noise here. Now this noise is multiplied by 0 0.007 um, just to give you some idea of where that comes from. That's basically equal to, let me choose a smaller, the square root of 3 times 1 over 256 squared. So if you were to take the three color channels and, and perturb each color channel just by one, so it's one out of 256 different levels, um, sort of the, the two norm, the length of that two norm uh, perturbation is 0 0.007. And so um, if you kind of, if you say the maximum over, if every pixel is perturbed by that same amount, Anyway, it doesn't, these details don't matter too much, but I'm just justifying that this is kind of like an infinity norm applied to a bunch of uh, three vector, two norms, whatever. It doesn't really matter. But anyway, we, we're perturbing 
all each color channel but just by one value out of 256 in, in whatever direction the gradient tells us to and we get this image over here which to me still looks like a panda in fact I can't really see any difference between the before and after and yet the model says with 99.3 percent confidence that this is a gibbon a gibbon is a different is a type of uh, monkey so that's an example of um, an adversarial attack. And this image on the right here is an adversarial image. Okay, so one can even look for the smallest image perturbation. That one up there is basically saying um, we're going to we're going to basically push uh, or find an image that's exactly uh, 0 0.007 away from our input. Um, and, and find uh, an adversarial example there. But you can say, maybe we don't even have to push that far. Maybe we can actually find an element, an adversarial uh, input that's even closer. So just a few examples. So um, there's the input on the left here. I've got three different examples. And then there's the delta x. Uh, doesn't look like much. And then on the right here is the perturbed image. And in every case here, the, um, the classifier thinks it's an ostrich. Okay. So it's really quite amazing how easy it is to find these adversarial examples. So overcoming this problem is a very active field of research. As I was saying at the beginning, it's really one of the things that's stopping neural networks from being deployed uh, for many, many different uh, sort of critical functions. Turns out if you need it to work for sure, um, it's not such a good idea. Uh, there are lots of examples where you just take a stop sign. It's a famous example. A stop sign and they put just three or four little stickers in, in the right spots and now the uh, the the sort of self-driving vision AI system doesn't see a stop sign. Instead, it sees, um, I think it was uh, a mileage, uh, sorry, a speed indicator, like max maximum speed, uh, 35 miles per hour or whatever. That's not a good idea. Instead of stopping, your car accelerates uh, through an intersection. So adversarial attacks are a big, big deal in AI right now. So an explanation. What Can we figure out why this is happening? Um, nobody knows for sure. Um, but there are some ideas. So why are classification networks so easily fooled? So consider the input space. For, for uh, MNIST, it's 32 by... Oh, no, it's not 32 by 32. It's 28 by 28. Um, 28 by 20. It doesn't matter. The, the actual numbers don't matter. The point is that the dimensions of the input space are quite high. Seven hundred eighty-four. By now, you've you've memorized that uh, twenty-eight times twenty-eight is seven hundred eighty-four. It's one of the benefits of uh, of working in AI. So that's a lot of axes. That means there are seven hundred eighty-four different axes. Picture three space. Now picture seven hundred eighty-one more axes, and that's the that's the dimensionality of the space that your inputs are coming from. Um, so that that space is partitioned into, for MNIST at least, partitioned into 10 different regions. So the classification network partitions this high dimensional space into regions. 10 regions for MNIST. And you can imagine for uh, ImageNet or CIFAR, it's 100 or 1,000 different, um, <clears throat> different partitions. So it turns out that most points are not too far away from a decision boundary. So let's look at a picture of the sort of thing that's happening here. Um, so th these graphics, I, I do I. These graphics come from uh, a colleague of mine, Hong Yang 
saying and I'll talk more about Hong Yang Zhang's work in the next video so here's a, a set of graphic that he created I've got this input space here on the left it's only 2d so it's I'm not really going to be able to drive home the sort of cursive dimensionality that uh, 784 dimensions would would uh, entail but here's a 2d space and we've got blue dots, we've got red dots, and you can see the decision boundary between the two. So this network model has managed to separate out these two classes. So these input, these 2D inputs go through this neural network, and then uh, here's some sort of representational space just before, um, just before we do some sort of uh, um, linear, um, we add one more linear layer to do the actual classification itself that goes to just one node that's either like zero or one. So from this classification space here, uh, this feature space, which I'm drawing on the right, you can see it happens to be linearly separable, which is why the network is able to solve this problem. Got the red dots on one side of the, the separator and blue dots on the other side of the linear separator. Great, so problem solved. Now what if we were to look at these, at these uh, points here and say, what's in the neighborhood? So if I were to sort of look in the neighborhood of that red dot, Let's say it corresponds to this red dot here. Now the neighborhood, the sort of uh, epsilon ball neighborhood in the input space might look like some weird shaped thing over here. Fine. That one seems okay. What about this one here? What if we took like this neighborhood? Well, you can see that neighborhood, that epsilon neighborhood actually crosses over the decision boundary, which is what's going on here. So what we end up getting is this dot here corresponds to that point there, which is on the wrong side of the decision boundary. Let me just label this thing here. This is the epsilon ball around X. Again, it's the, it's the elements X in the input domain such that X minus x and I've drawn it here as the infinity norm it's less than or equal to epsilon infinity norm in the Cartesian space looks like a, a square or a rectangle or something okay so the the problem seems to be that many points are not too far away from the decision boundary it's hard to visualize but we can I can show you that that seems to be the case. Um, so learning, sort of in summary, learning is the act of minimizing, I'm looking over here now, the act of minimizing the expected loss over our data set. An adversarial attack is, um, there are two different kinds. There's the untargeted, which is this first one, maximizing the loss for that given target. So I've written it there. This is untargeted. Or, if you like, minimizing, also in the epsilon ball, minimizing the loss, oh, that should be a T. Minimizing the loss for the wrong target. And this is targeted. So pulling it towards the wrong target, the wrong class. Okay, so let's look at, look at some examples quickly. Here I'm showing some untargeted. Untargeted uh, adversarial examples. So I've got the 10 MNIST digits. You're going to do this on your assignment, by the way. I've got the 10 MNIST digits, and I'm showing this is after just a small number of gradient ascent steps, basically uh, for the correct class, increasing the loss. So this over here, for the class zero, I'm pushing the input image, this, in, this picture of this zero, pushing it in the direction to increase the loss. And so after a few steps, you can see 
um, the, the probability or the confidence that it's a zero has gone down to 0 0.033 and the confidence that it's a two has gone up to 96.7%. So you can see I've given an example of, of each one. Uh, they're all, the misclassification has a confidence of at least 90%. But they all look like the, they look like the digits. Um, if I were to ask someone um, what digits they are, they'd probably not get fooled. Um, this one over here, though, is kind of interesting. That one, it's supposed to be a four, but if you ask me, um, it looks a bit like a nine. And sure enough, when it gets pushed away from the four, um, the first digit, um, the first class it, it encounters is a nine. So it gets misclassified as nine. So you can often look at these um, examples and sort of justify. This one here is a six. It gets misclassified as a six. I can see that. That five kind of looks a bit six-ish. So these are interesting in that way. And then finally, a targeted attack. So in this case, on the left, there's a picture of a nine, but I'm, I'm saying change it so that it looks more like a seven. So it's targeted because I've chosen seven. I want to convert this thing that's classified as a nine to misclassify it as a seven. And it still looks like a nine to me, but this image gets misclassified as a seven with 96.8% uh, confidence. This next one here is a five. It was a five, but I have targeted six and said change it to decrease the loss for the class of six. And this last one, it misinterprets the three as an eight. So I hope I've shown you um, how um, how important this problem is and how easy it is to fool classification networks into misclassifying uh, the input from adversarial examples. The problem is people can target your uh, target your network and generate inputs specifically to fool it, and um, that's a dangerous thing. So it's an open problem in AI right now.